<laughs> Still here. <clears throat> hey, good morning, Real Life Church. Glad that you were here this morning. Excited about today. We are in uh, the closing series or closing sermon of our series called Strange Encounters. Uh, if you're a guest with us here, you can welcome to go back and check out our YouTube channel where the last three weeks have been in there. But we've been just talking about the strange moments that happen in Scripture. Week one, we talked about Jacob actually wrestling with God. Uh, week after that, we talked about the she-bears coming out of the woods and eating the kids, which is my favorite, um, just simply because of the bald head comment in there. I relate. And then last week, we talked about communion. We had several comments on our ser communion service last week said, hey, I, I know more about communion now than I've ever taken the time to learn based on last week. And so I, wanted, I, wanted, I appreciate the comments, and hopefully it was beneficial for you. I hope you're learning through this series to really dig into the Scripture and see what the Bible says, because there are some great things in Scripture that we miss because we get stuck in, we get stuck in a coffee cup type of Christianity. Like, we only really like the verses that if they put it on a coffee cup, then that's our jam. You know, the good stuff. You know, we want to know that his, his strength is made perfect in our weakness. We, we want to know that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Most of us know that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We know those things, but if we don't go beyond those things into some of the deeper portions of Scripture, I'm just afraid we miss I'm afraid we build a Christianity that, that can be easily swayed. And so the Strange Encounter series has been just that. It's just, let's dig into some stuff in the Bible that maybe you don't really see that often. It's, they're not going to put the she-bears on your Christmas calendar. Okay? It's not going to, it would be awesome, but they're not going to. All right? They're just not going to. And so today, we're going to be in the book of Daniel, and we're going to talk through another one of those stories that... That at the end comes across as very harsh, and, and I want to make sure we walk through that because, and I'm so thankful that the worship team just sang the goodness of God. We think, I think it's really critical that we understand that everything that occurs in the Bible is a result of the goodness of God. And, and sometimes we can read things in the Bible and you go, Vince, I don't understand. She bears. Well, you have to go back and look at that story really a lot closer to understand what was truly happening there. But it's because God is so good that we're able to go to this book and we're actually able to see what it is that he's trying to teach us in his scriptures. So if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Daniel chapter 5 today. The book of Daniel chapter 5, uh, you can just kind of hang out there because I'm going to spend quite a bit of time telling some backstory to what's going on. Before we get into the sermon, while you're turning there, I want to just give you some heads up on what's in front of me out here. These, these bags in front of me, if you're in a life group, you know what these are because in your life group we had you build them. And we put a sucker, slid it down inside an invite. On the back of it has our service times for both this location and our Gainesville location. And each bag has 10 invites in it. How many of you are going to have trick-or-treaters tonight? Say amen. Let me, let me, let's back up here real quick. We, got, we have to assess this situation. How many of you would have trick-or-treaters? You're just grumpy and are going to leave your lights off. sinners. <laughs> no, I, if you, I, I know in our neighborhood, we'll probably see over 100 to 200 trick-or-treaters come by our house, okay? And I love it. I love it because I'm a people junkie, and there's nothing better than watching people with their kids try to be patient so that their kids don't freak out when the parents take their Reese cups, Okay? How many of you know that's going to happen tonight? In Jesus' name, I'm taking the good stuff. All right? And so what these are, this was just, I said, you know what? How can we, in, how, how do we get into our community in a lot of uh, some ways that maybe we haven't done in the past? We said, let's do this. Let's just create invites for you to go ahead and put in the bags as kids come to your door. And so if you're going to be out and you're going to see trick-or-treaters this week, and let me just, those of you that are not going to do that, let me challenge you this way. Just take one and hand it out. Everybody likes a sucker. Okay? Put it at your desk at work and offer it to people that come by your desk. I don't care how you utilize it. This is a, this is a conversation starter at best, and it's an invite where you don't have to do any work but go. That's it. Somebody will take it from you because I made it mandatory. I told our life groups, we don't want the cheap suckers. We got the good stuff in here. We got the blow pops and the Tootsie Pops. 
where you don't only get sucker, you get a bonus. There's gum. There's a Tootsie Roll in there, okay? It's kind of like church. You can come to church, and it's good. But if you get saved, you get the bonus, and you get heaven. See, I can preach on a Tootsie Pop, all right? So take a, at the end of service, I'm going to just t- challenge you. Hey, come grab a bag. Come grab two bags. Maybe you're, you say, I don't, I don't want to walk to the front of the building or whatever. At the end, I, however you do it, there's some out front that you can grab as you leave today. But grab some of these. Get the invites out to your community, to your, to your friends, your family, to your enemies, to your neighbors, to your coworkers, to the kids that are going to walk by your door today. All right? It's just a great opportunity. Second thing is, I uh, hope some of you guys were able to pick up some lemonade as you come in. Anybody, anybody stop on the way in and get lemonade? I got a few of you. You need to stop on your way out. Okay? I'm just telling you. Two reasons. A, the lemonade's phenomenal. And you can get, I think, 32 different variations of lemonade, which I didn't know was possible. Secondly, I believe Real Life Church is a generous church. I believe that's one of our core values, and I believe we show it. We show it all the time. We show it in our, our Christmas giving annually at the church. We show, you guys show it in your tithes and offerings and your giving weekly at church. But sometimes it's easy just to give money to the church because that's what we do. Other times you have an organization. It's a Christian organization. It's a Christian-ran organization. Uh, it's just a restaurant in Poplar Bluff, and they have this lemonade truck that they send out. And they came in this weekend, and, and things didn't go nearly as what was expected by them. All right, and so we ran into him yesterday, and I said, hey, how's it going this week? So proud you guys are over here. Uh, I'm familiar with him from Poplar Bluff, and I said, so good to see you guys over here. They said, well, it's just not gone really well, and we haven't done as much as we'd like to have done, and I don't even know that it's going to be worth the trip. In fact, we're behind quite a bit to making the trip, and I'm like, man, I'm so sorry, and then I said, what time do you leave tomorrow? They said, we're going to stay the night and then head back tomorrow, and I said, if you can give me the morning, if you'll just come set up, I can't promise you anything. But you'll sell some lemonade tomorrow if you'll come to Real Life Church. I said that in full knowledge, knowing that we are a generous church. Okay? Go support them. Swing by, high-five them, buy lemonade. If you don't want a lemonade, buy a lemonade for the person behind you. All right? And support that local business. So support those people because they're great people. They're going to be generous with it on the other side of it. And so it's just an opportunity for us to be the hands and feet of Christ to someone that's not necessarily from our area, but someone outside our area that needed Real Life Church today. So y'all with me on that? So y'all jump in, wear them out a little bit. We, we, love, we love food trucks here at Real Life Church. Uh, I don't know if food trucks is a love language, but it could be mine. <laughs> All right. Somebody said, we went to the, the rally yesterday where the food trucks were, and somebody was like, oh, you went to the motorcycle rally yesterday? I'm like, yeah. They're like, you ride? And I went, no, I like food trucks. That's legit why I went. I just, the cool motorcycle, dude. Um, where's the hamburgers? That's, that was real. I was at. So uh, I hope there are food trucks in heaven. I think it's going to be great. So now that you all know where we're at, do that after service. Grab a bag of this after service. Let's get into the sermon today. Strange encounter. The book of Daniel itself is a strange encounter. All right? The book of Daniel is broke down in two halves. The front half of it is technically history. It's the history of Daniel and some of the other Hebrew children being taken into captivity. They took the Hebrew men into captivity, and they took the cream of the crop, and they brought them into the palace or into the, the, the royal city of Babylon there to where they would be able to ingrain them with their teaching. And so leaders at the top, let's give the leaders the right thing to think, And then it'll trickle down into the rest of the population was the mindset and the ideology behind it. So they took Daniel and some of the other guys in and they said, we're going to start ingraining our methodology. In fact, they went so far as to change their name. Uh, We know him as Daniel in Babylon. They knew him as Belteshazzar, which is, I'm really thankful we call him Daniel, aren't you? And so uh, they changed his name when he was there and they started giving them these Um, this list of things to do. You need to eat these certain foods. You need to think this certain way. And so Daniel had this, uh, he said, we're not going to eat what you want us to eat. And he said, in fact, if you want to take half the group and you feed them, I'll take the other half of the group and we'll eat what God tells us to eat. And now today we have the ever famous Daniel fast and the Daniel diet that a lot of people do. Um, And we've made it trendy because that's just what people do. Uh, But it was a real thing that Daniel did 
in the book of Daniel. We see that story unfold. We also see and hear about these great guys named Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. How many of you know those people from the Bible? All right, well, let me give you their other names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, now, how many of you know who I'm talking about? Yeah, the fiery furnace kids. Like, these guys, it was a great story. If you grew up in Sunday school at all, this was like Sunday school Super Bowl story. Like, if you needed to really get the point across that God was a good God, then you told the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego story. Well, that happens in Daniel, the book of Daniel. And so we have the book of Daniel, these three Hebrew boys, they won't bow down, they won't pray when they're supposed to, they won't follow what they are, and so they're going to throw them in a fiery furnace. King Nebuchadnezzar is the king at the time, and so he says, throw them in the furnace. The fire was so hot that the guards that threw them in burst into flames on the outside of the fire. Some of you know what that's like when you open your oven and get too close, right? Just multiply that by a bunch. And so we have this moment happen where Nebuchadnezzar feels like he's one, and then it says he looks into the fire and he goes, hold on. Didn't I throw three men in the flame? Yes, your majesty, you threw three. Then why do I see a fourth man walking around as if it were the Son of God? See, this is good stuff, man, right? You could preach that all day long. That in the midst of your fire, there is a presence that you didn't see when you went in, and you may not recognize him when you come out, but through the fire, he was with you. All right? Let's see, like I said, it, that'll preach all day long. So we have that happen in Daniel. We have this other moment where Daniel, we know that the, the big one, Daniel, and the lion's den. He gets tossed in the lion's den for not praying when he was supposed to, or not doing what he was supposed to, or praying to the wrong gods, not bowing down to the idol. And they're going to chunk him in the lion's den. They chunk him in the lion's den, and he hangs out with the lions all night. We're going to kind of lean into some of this story, because the last part of Daniel, we don't touch as much, the last part of Daniel is prophecy. It's when God begins to download the end times onto Daniel in the Old Testament. It cracks me up. People will come to me and go, oh, Pastor Vince, can we do a study on Revelation? I'm like, yeah, we'll do a study on Revelation the moment you read the book of Daniel, the book of Amos, the book of Zephaniah, the book of Zechariah, the book of Obadiah, and the other small, major, and minor prophets. Then you'll have a complete understanding of what the book of Revelation is trying to say. Not one person has come back to me with that list read yet <laughs> and said, oh, we were just kind of hoping you'd tell us what happened. Here's the reality. At the end of it all, I get to go home with Jesus because I know Jesus. Are we living in those days now? Well, we're closer to them now than we were yesterday. Right? I, I, Christians, we don't panic. I see Christians getting fearful of the last days. I'm like, you missed it. If you're a Christian, you ought not be fearful for the last days. You ought to be cheerleading them. You ought to be saying, come on, even so, John was. He got the full view of the last days, and at the end of it, he said, even so, Lord, let's do it. I mean, those are my words. <laughs> he said, even so, Lord, come quickly. Let's do this. And so Daniel, through the last half of the book of Daniel, it's all prophetic. And some, if you just read through it, you're going to be like, what is going on in Daniel's? Uh, maybe it had something to do with the foodie, because it gets weird when some of Daniel's stuff. But, so the last part, but in the history of Daniel, we see some great stuff. We also see some stuff that's strange. We see some stuff that's strange. And so uh, obviously we get to the story about the, uh, the fiery furnace and we see King Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to lean into two kings, even though Daniel was under several. We're going to lean into King Nebuchadnezzar and we're going to lean into his son, King Belshazzar. And so as we talk about King Nebuchadnezzar first, we have to pick up on some, some things that show themselves to be evident. So we know the story of the fiery furnace and this, this is what happens when Nebuchadnezzar sees there's a fourth man in the fire. He says this to him, he says, Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other, what's it say, church? Is that a big G or a little g? Don't miss that. There's no other God who is able to rescue in this way. In the King James Version of the Bible, it said, no God, little g, can deliver in this manner. So what Nebuchadnezzar was doing was Nebuchadnezzar was saying, their God's a really good God if you need delivered from something. 
Now, we go, well, that's not true, but yet how many of you and I treat God just like that, that he's only good in certain areas of our life? Like, he's a good God if somebody's sick and we need to pray, but if you want me to trust him with my finances, I got this. Like, he's a good God if the blue lights are on behind me, because I'm going to pray then. I'm going to be in deep prayer. I'm gonna be pray- I want to be praying when the cop wake- walks up so he thinks I'm spiritual. But when it comes to my marriage, I got this, God. We get upset at Nebuchadnezzar because he said, well, your God is good for this. And we go, no, no, he is the God of everything. Except we don't live like he's the God of everything. We live like he's the God of some things in our life. It amazes me how often we'll trust God with all of our sin and only parts of our life. I say it amazes me in myself also. Don't think that that's just a shot because I struggle too from time to time of having the things I go to God with and other things that I think he's equipped me to handle. And then I realize that about the moment I think I'm equipped to handle it is about the moment I usually just make a train wreck of the whole thing. Any, anybody amen with me on that? Yeah. yeah. Man, there's been some, some doozies. And so here we see Nebuchadnezzar committing that. He does it later on, too. In the next chapter, we see in actually chapter 4 of Daniel, we see Nebuchadnezzar. This is chapter 3 where the fiery furnace happens, and Nebuchadnezzar said, Daniel's God, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's God is a good God if you need delivered. And then chapter 4 happens, and chapter 4, King Nebuchadnezzar goes to sleep one night, and he wakes up, and he's just rattled to his core. The Bible says he wakes up with a dream, and he, ha- he can't understand the dream. And so he begins to call on everybody he can to interpret the dream. Comes back, he says, we need to get Daniel in the room. Go get Daniel, his God. He's a God that interprets dreams. See what they're doing? They're still putting him in specific spots. He's a God that delivers. He's a God that interprets dreams. No, he's a God that does it all. You just got to trust him for that. And they said, well, go get Daniel. And Daniel comes in and says, well, king, tell me the dream. And the king says, I had a dream that there was a great tree. And the tree rose into the clouds. And you, from the top of the tree, you could see all of the world and all of the glory of the world and the majesty of the world. And it belonged to the tree. But the tree fell down and sat under the dew of the heavens in the place where the donkeys, the wild donkeys or beast of the field resided. But God left the stump there. I don't get it, Daniel. And Daniel said, oh, king, I would that this dream were about your enemies. But I fear it's about you. You are the tree, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your renown is beyond who you want to die will die. Who you want to live will live. Who you want to set up will be set up. And who you want to bring down will be brought down. You are the king of Babylon. If you want to study history at all, you know that Babylon's reach was worldwide. It was something that was enormous. It was, it was a reign, really. And so this was Babylon. And Daniel's going, you are the tree. And God's going to take you down. But he's going to leave a stump so that something comes from it. And for seven years, you will live among the beast of the field, and the dew of heaven will soak you every morning. And you know what King Nebuchadnezzar did about it? Nothing. He said within a year's time, Nebuchadnezzar was walking on his balcony. And he was looking out over the great kingdom of Babylon. And as he looked out over the great kingdom of Babylon, he said, look at the king in which I have established. Look at all that I have done. May it be for my majesty. And in that moment, God showed up. And God humbled him. It says that he lost his mind and he left the palace, ran out of the palace, ended up eating the grass of the field like the oxen. Okay? ended up living amongst the wild beast of the field, and every morning the dew would soak him because he slept outdoors. Seven years eating grass, living with wild donkeys. How many of you sold your oats in a very different way? That's what happened to him. Seven years until one day his senses came back to him. When his senses came back to him, something really interesting happened. Here's the verse in chapter 4. Now... I, Nebuchadnezzar, 
praise and extol and honor the king of heaven for what's it say next all this isn't just the god of deliverance anymore this just isn't the god of interpreting dreams but i praise and honor the king of heaven for all his works are right and his ways are just and those this line right here church and those who walk in pride he is able to humble how many of you have ever been humbled before? How many of you enjoyed the process? Yeah. When we were younger, my family, we did martial arts. So my dad, my mom, me and my brother. And we would do tournaments. And in one of the tournaments I'd went to, just before the tournament, I'd been taught a new kick that I thought, oh, it's the one. It wasn't like this, don't worry, I didn't do that but I thought I was about to have my Daniel LaRusso moment. I thought it was going to be all Valley, baby, and it was going to be me and the Cobra Kai at the end, and I was going to win because that's, I'd learned a new kick, and it was going to be awesome. I made it through the first round pretty quick, pretty easily, actually, and so I strutting a little bit. Got into the second round, stepped into the ring, and a young lady stepped across from me. I'm just going to tell you, and I'm going to admit to this, I was a prideful punk kid, and so I thought, if nothing else, that girl is not going to beat me. I am not sexist in any way, but I was then. I'm like, that girl ain't going to beat me. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to outpoint her, and then at the end, I'm going to close it off by doing this new kick. And then they're going to put me in magazines and write movies about me. And me and, <laughs> me and Chuck Norris and Bruce Lee are going to do some, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be phenomenal. Woo! I was excited. So I got in the turn, got in the ring, first round, outpointed her pretty badly. Second round, she come back. It was pretty close. Into the second round, I thought, here we go. I'm not messing around with her anymore. I'm going to throw this kick at her. She's not going to see it coming. And so in this kick, you throw one leg to the inside and you swing it outside while the other one follows it. Right inside of the head. Wham! I was you're like, you're mean. Yeah, I was. <laughs> That's a mean 12-year-old, let me tell you. But I was going to get her. So at the end of it, set up just right. I threw that first leg. And, the, and, and there is a moment in the kick where you're exposed for about that long. And sadly, she was about that fast. <laughs> and she got me. So I'm sitting here. Just about the time I get exposed, she went, bam. <laughs> and I walked over here, knelt down. My dad said, what, what is that? I'm like, what? He said, what's on your hip? And I felt my hip, and I was like, oh, this is about to get more awkward. He said, what is that? I said, it's my cup. <laughs> and I, it's not hilarious. Listen, I'm feeling no grace or mercy from my flock right now. So my dad said, you got to fix it. I'm like, I'm in front of the entire auditorium of people here. I'm not going to fix this. He's like, you got to fix it. You can't do the last round without it. And I'm like, I don't want to do the last round. She just kicked, <laughs> she just leveled me right here in front of God and everybody. I, didn't, I don't care about Daniel LaRusso. He's a liar. <laughs> I got humbled quickly. After the match, my dad said this to me. He said, did you need that? I'm like, what are you, are you smoking dope, Dad? Why would you say something like that? He's like, did you need that? Did I need what? He said, did you need to get beat by the girl? I don't care who I fight. Did you just need to get beat? Because you didn't think you were going to get beat. You didn't, you didn't, that wasn't in your mind anywhere that could happen, right? And I'm like, no. Even less so that it was going to be a girl that beat you, right? Yes. He said, so did you need that? I didn't want a life lesson at the time, but looking back, I'm really thankful he gave it to me because I needed that. Christians, sometimes the thing that keep people farthest away from us is our arrogance as Christians. When the thing that ultimately draws them to them is the brokenness of our forgiveness. 
be willing to share the brokenness and your forgiveness rather than the arrogance of your royalty. I know I'm a daughter or a son of the king. I, I know I'm a child of God. But if I lead with that, instead of saying I'm forgiven by God, not all the time does it work. And so Nebuchadnezzar reached this point. He said, and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble you. So we're going to fast forward now because now Nebuchadnezzar is gone and his son, King Belshazzar, picks up. He picks up and you're like, are we still in the introduction? Are we in the sermon yet? Yes. So Belshazzar is born and Belshazzar begins to raise up. Belshazzar seen this. He watched all of this happen with Nebuchadnezzar. He was born before it happened, before he lost his mind and for seven years lived in the fields with the beast. He watched it happen and learned nothing. So we see Belshazzar, he takes on the throne, and he's having a party one night, and it is a throwdown affair. There are a thousand people there. His wives are there. His concubines are there. The palace people are there. His, his whole entourage is there. And the Bible actually mentions there are thousands there. And he says, hey, hey, I remember when my dad took the temple in Israel, and it was filled with gold and silver we should go get all the gold and silver cups and bowls and let's get wasted drinking out of that. So he was taking the things from the temple of God and going to get plastered out of them. Now, I want to just tell you this in case you didn't know or you weren't aware. God is a gracious God. How many of you know that to be true? Amen. That God will show you grace when you obey. It happens. God will show you grace when you obey or disobey. But there will come a line in the sand that you will not cross with God, and he will check you. And Belshazzar crossed the line. He said, I'll be disobeyed, but I won't be dishonored. I'll be disobeyed, but you won't disrespect the God of heaven and earth. And so what happens next is this story where we see this act happen, and then God shows up. It says, they drank wine, and they praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. Do you notice what all these things are? It's all the materials we make stuff out of. And the verse says they spent their time worshiping the gods of stuff, things. And as they drank from the gold and silver that God had consecrated for the temple, which there was a process to that if you read the Old Testament, as they drank and made merry and thought flippantly of the God of creation, they worshiped the stuff around them. Look at what we've made. Look at what we've done. This is what will make us happy. This is what will bring us joy. This is what will bring us a sustenance and, and supply. This is the stuff. And God says, you just crossed the line. And so in verse 5, it says this, and immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand, and the king saw the hand as it wrote. How many of you know the phrase, the handwriting's on the wall? <laughs> you know, all the writing's on the wall. That's where this comes from. Is this moment in Daniel chapter 5. You say, well, what did what, what, what it say? What did it say? What is it? Well, we'll get there. Don't worry. But this is the moment where the king realizes something out there is much bigger than him. Okay. Because he saw the hand appear, and it's only the hand. There's not a body attached to the hand. There's not, and I don't know how it wrote on the wall. I don't know if it etched it into the plaster. I don't know if it was ink. I don't know if it was blood. The Bible doesn't say, so please don't add to it. It just says that a hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the king's wall. And King Belshazzar reacted 
I want you to catch that. He reacted the same way you and I would. Then the king's color changed, and his thoughts alarmed him, and his limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. Can I get an amen? amen. Listen, if a hand appears on the wall behind me, all of you are going to go, ah, it's amazing what they can do with video nowadays. <laughs> but if you turned around and looked at the drywall behind you, and a hand appeared and wrote a message on that wall, how many knees are knocking in the room right now? Mine are. How many times have you ever truly been terrified? Anybody been truly terrified? Yeah. My boys went to the haunted house. They, they, they like to go and be scared and terrified, which I don't understand. Um, I don't get it. Uh, some, how many of you are scary movie people, haunted house people? Hands up. If that's you, just put it. It's okay. You don't have to be ashamed of it. It's all right. If that's you, hands up. I'm going to see it again. All right, good. Don't be ashamed. You're a little crazy, all right? <laughs> so my, my son, they're, they're, they're like this, and we were talking about it, and they were talking. I said, was it scary? Well, it was a little scary, you know, it was scary when one person chased me. I can't remember which son said it, but I think we were talking about last year's haunted house, and they went to a different one last year, and it was super scary. And I'm like, what, well, did you cry? They're like, no, I didn't cry, but I peed a little. <laughs> I'm like, that's pretty scary. <laughs> so... I would choose crying <laughs> over the two <laughs> options if I had to. So, uh, but I, re I can remember being terrified. My dad used to terrify me as a child, not, not in an abusive or, or unhealthy, well, it was unhealthy, but um, <laughs> because like he would hide from me and my dad was uh, f heating an air guy. So there was moments where we'd be working on the furnace in our house and he'd leave, have the breaker shut off so I'd be pitch black and I'd, he'd call for me, Vince, come here. So I'd run to try to see what dad needed. And I was six years old. I'd walk into the, the back furnace room, all the lights pitch black, and he'd poke his head around the furnace with a flashlight under his chin and go, ha, ha, like that. <laughs> so I can relate with my son that peed a little. <laughs> I, can, I get it. I can remember being scared. Then, I, then there are moments that we're terrified, and we're terrified because we don't know what's next. And that's where Belshazzar is. He's terrified. Because writing doesn't show up on the wall just randomly. It just doesn't show up randomly. There, there's something that happens here. And so we see this moment happen. And so Belshazzar does what only he knows to do. He calls all of his musicians. He calls all of his people together. He calls his sorcerers. He calls his, his uh, doctors. He calls the astrologers. He calls his scientists. If you, if you look in the Old Testament and you study the language, what you'll find out about the word uh, sorcerer is most of the time that word breaks down to the word pharmacist. And so what's happening is he's calling anybody that can mix a substance to help him figure out what's been written on the wall. Now, here's the interesting part. There were people there that could interpret the words. They knew how to translate the words on the wall. But they didn't know how to tell him what it meant. How many of you have ever went to counsel for people that might give you good advice, but it's just not God's advice? Because they may tell you the words that you need to hear, but they don't have the intent and the heart behind it in the right place. And so we see here this happening with Belshazzar. She calls for everybody. So finally the queen walks in. Now the queen is not Belshazzar's wife. The queen is Belshazzar's mom. And she said, I know a guy. He talked to your dad a lot. When your dad, Nebuchadnezzar, had some issues, when he would have a dream or when he would have something crazy go on that he couldn't figure out, he always called for the same guy. Well, who was it? His name is Daniel. You need to bring him to the house. And so they call for Daniel, and Daniel comes to the house. And he walks in, and Daniel looks around the room, and Belshazzar says, Daniel, if you will interpret this, I will give you the purple robes and riches, and I will make you the third highest ruler in all of Babylon. And Daniel said, you can keep your stuff, but I'll interpret it. You can keep it. I don't want anything over my head when I tell you what it says. But I'll interpret it. And so he just interprets the words. And he says the word mine. Mine, and he says it twice. Mine, mine. How many of you know in the New Testament when we hear Jesus say verily, verily, or truly, truly, he's really wanting us to lean in and pay attention to what he's about to say. The same is true back here. And the word mine means you've been numbered. That's the translation of the word. But Daniel was there not to give the translation, to give the interpretation. He said, what does it mean, Daniel? He says, it means your kingdom has been numbered. 
Your days are numbered. Second word, tikel, which means what? It means you've been weighed. Weighed. I know that's the word, Daniel, but what's the, trend? what's the interpretation? We'll get there in just a second. The last one is parson or peris. Peris is the singular, parson is the plural, but it means divided. Your kingdom will be divided. And so Belshazzar said, okay, give him the robes, give him the gold, give him the position. I know he said he didn't want it, but give it to him anyway. I, now I got the message. I didn't give you all the message because I want to break down the first two phrases pretty, pretty quick here. The first one is your days are numbered. This fits for Belshazzar, and sadly, I don't know that you wanted to come to a service like this today, but it fits for us as well. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, chapter 90, it says, and you need to learn to number your days. You say, Vince, that's depressing. It's not depressing, it's challenging. Because how many days do we go into with no intention of actually changing the outcome of the day? See, when we number our days, it means we take a look at the day and we say, God, in this day, what am I going to accomplish for your kingdom? When we number the day, we say, you know what, this is more critical than people understand. I'm not just going to get up, drink my coffee, go to work, come home, eat my dinner, put the kids to bed, go to sleep, and do it again tomorrow. No, in this day, what am I going to do differently? In this day, how am I going to impact? Teach us, God, to number our days because we don't know when they stop. We don't know when they stop. Oh, Vince, I got another good 20 years in me. Not according to the Bible. According to the Bible, it says, for it is appointed for man once to die, and after that, the judgment. You have an appointment with God, and he don't tell any of us when it's going to be. You say, well, Vince, I, I'm, just, I'm just praying that the Lord will get me when he comes back. Awesome. I hope he does, but your appointment's already been set. What have you done to be ready for it? What have you done to be truly prepared for that face-to-face -face with God? Because that's what he's telling Belshazzar. He's like, listen, your kingdom is numbered. The way you've been doing it, and listen, I'm going to tell you again. That's why Mine is in there twice. He said, I'm going to tell you again. You're living a prideful life where you're worshiping these gods of wood and stone and gold and steel and, and iron and, and the stuff. And you're chasing after stuff when there is a God you ought to be chasing after and your days are numbered. Get it right, Belshazzar. Get it straight. And I can almost see Belshazzar maybe pushing back against that a little bit going, hey, I get it. One of these days I'm going to die, but while I'm going to live or while I'm here, I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. Except for this, that the translation or the interpretation of the word Tikel wasn't just weighed. It was, you have been weighed in the balance and you've come up short. You don't have enough on the other side if you're only depending on you to get to the other side. It's one of the most terrifying phrases in scripture to me. Second only to depart from me, you worker of sin, I have never known you. That phrase is hallowing. And, and, we, and it should be, it should be, but the problem is we as Christians, we get so excited when we realize that we get to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into thy rest. We're excited, so excited about that that we forgot that our neighbor's only option at this point is depart from me unless we get in their way. Unless I step in the way of saying, you know what, I've got to get in the way. I don't want you to hear depart from me. I want you to hear enter in. So let me tell you about Jesus. It's the same statement that we hear in the Old Testament when Belshazzar hears this phrase. You're coming up short. But I'm a prophet of God and you can call out to him like your dad did. You can call out to him, Belshazzar. You can say that he is the God of all, and it is his word and his will and his way that controls everything, or you can carry on. 
But I'm telling you, you've been weighed in the balance and you've come up short. You say, Vince, what does that mean for us? Let me just tell you the God's honest truth. I preach roughly 150 to 175 times a year. I think I do a pretty good job. And I think that there are times when I go, Lord, I'm doing your work. And I still come up short. I teach a life group and have a great time with my team in there. And guess what? At the end of it all, if that was what I came to God with and said, I preach and I lead a life group, I still come up short. God, you've blessed me with kids and kids that are mine, kids that are not mine, kids that I'll claim as mine, and I've tried to be a good influence in their life, and I've tried to show them the gospel. And at the end of the day, I will still come up short. But God, I'm a good husband. 24 years, I've been faithful to my wife, God, and I am more in love with her now than I've ever been before. And it's, it's still not enough. If I were weighed in the balance right now based on me, it would still come up short. So Vince, this is not, this is not a pleasant sermon. Oh, it is. You see, because God knew we would come up short. God knew there wasn't a way for me to get to him on my own. He knew there, wasn't, there was nothing in me that was going to be good enough to get there. And so Jesus says, Father, forgive Vince. He doesn't know. He doesn't have enough to get to you without me. But he's mine. He's accepted me. And so now, don't put Vince in the scale. Put me in the scale. And when you put Jesus in the scale, the whole thing shifts. And I wonder in your life today, listen to me, church. We, we can cheer about that. And I want you to be celebratory about the fact that Jesus is that for you. But let me ask you, have you been living like the king that says, I only use him for this and not all of it? Because if you're only using him for parts, it's still you in the scale. It's still you in the scale. He's not taking the seat there. You see, I, what I believe is that all my life that God has been faithful, like we just sang a little while ago. I'm going to have Cody sing this song, this chorus. And you can sing it with him if you'd like, but here's what I'd really rather you do. If you want to sing, you can sing. But right now, I want you to look at your heart and say, God, if I stood before you right now, if I truly accepted that it's you that will stand before God for me, or if I've been weighed in the balance, and have I come up short? Have I been weighed in the balance and I've come up short? I don't know your life right now. I don't know what things you're walking through, but what I'm asking you to right now, before we leave today, is you'd take a moment and you'd just bow and you'd say, God, in my life, have I trusted you with the scale? And if not, if you don't know, if there is still a part of you that right now, when you hear the phrase, you have been weighed in the balance and you come up short, you come up wanting, if that stirs your heart in any way, you need to move. 